The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. And good morning, everybody. Tommy O'Brien coming to you live from TFNN. Tommy O'Brien the fourth. He's taking the day off today. He's out there hanging out with Nana. Uh, everyone's feeling good for the first time in a little while. So we're back at it. Looking forward to an hour of action packed uh, market commentary and news. And we got some action to kick things off with the S&Ps off by 23 points. That's about half a percent. And boy, you see the acceleration. About 6.30 in the morning, things were flat in this market. And just like that, we get a three-hour run to lower prices. We're sitting at 4,300 in the S&P. NASDAQ 100 off 7 tenths percent right now, off 104 points, 14,880. We got the Dow off about 4 tenths percent, 33,500. The Russell off by nine. Crude, $88.49 this morning. Gold off $5 to 18.42. The dollar has been strong, right, to put it lightly. Dollar. Pushing 107.21. And the story of the day, it's been the story of the week. It's been the story of last month. It might be the story of this month. How about a 106 handle on the 10-year? Now, we got yields right now on the 10-year, 4.71, 4.71. But, yeah, I was saying, when I came on the air, we were at lows. We were at 4.73, 4.74, I think is almost what we got to on the 10-year. Those are all the headlines. Highest level in 16 years, 4.71. Think about that. Over a 10-year period, guaranteed that interest rate to compound. We have not seen it in 16 years. Uh, yeah. And let's get around to the 30-year that is reclawing some of those losses or clawing some of those losses back, I should say. We're back above 112. But boy, I've been talking about the fact that context is important, right? When we were having these conversations, so that's the monthly. Let's put it, now you got to put it on the monthly to go that back that far. So look at the month we had in September already. We're, what, two days into October? No, that's just the one day in October. 112.02 is where we're sitting at. We started last month at 121 and change. You got up to 121.29, right? Mammoth moves on the 30-year, the 10-year, across the board. We have the 10-year sitting at 4.73, and we are seeing a little bit of a pullback right now. But I'm jumping around to see how yields have reacted because I've been talking about the ladders, right? So what are we at? We're now at a 5.15% five-year CD, 5.15%. A five-year CD, you're talking about 4.8%. Okay, it's important to have that context of where we are on a CD because that is some of the competition for market funds, at least keeping that in mind. And I keep saying it, man, if you're in the upper echelon of retirement, you're talking about retirement money that you aren't willing to see a 20% pullback ASAP, you should consider a hefty portion of your portfolio, man, in CDs when you are pulling 5.15%. And the reason why I say, let me just, I'm going to copy this so you can take a look at it. The reason why I say the CD in particular is because it's less risk when you're into a CD. Okay, we got to talk yields, man. We got to talk CDs. We got to talk guaranteed risk-free rate of return. So these are the CD rates right now. Now, these are non-callable, okay? They are brokerage CDs. Make sure. But nonetheless, the guaranteed rates on each duration on a one year, you're pushing 5.5. .5. On a two year, 5.4. Three year, 5.15. A four year, let me even expand it. There we go. A four year, 4.9. And the five years pushing 4.8. Now, the reason why it's so cool doing a ladder, okay, is because every year you get to catch up with what the market interest rate is, protecting yourself if inflation really roars. That's the worry here, okay? Because you could say, well, geez, that's a great ladder. But you know what? I don't need to ladder things. I'm just going to go out to that five year and go to 4.8% because I'm worried that inflation is going to go down in the next year or two. And even that five year in a year or two 
is going to be dramatically lower. So that could be the case, right? That is the case. That is a potential opportunity cost of locking this in. But here's the kicker. What if inflation keeps going higher? Okay, over the last year, we've seen this play out. People locked in rates at a very reasonable rate of return. Okay, this is not like if you need to trade out of these that you're going to lose capital. If you plan on holding these through expiration, through the duration of the CD, you will get that risk-free rate of return. So maybe people locked in 4% last year, but here's the problem. Inflation is still roaring, so the real rate of return is not as high as you may have anticipated, okay? By laddering CDs, your real rate of return stays closer to, if it's a positive number, it's a positive number, okay? But you're more protected because if inflation goes up, when these ladders roll off on a yearly basis, what's going to happen? You're still going to be getting lofty interest rates to compensate you for the inflation that's roaring. The flip side of that is, is if inflation gets squashed and the economy is in trouble and the Fed is cutting, what will happen? Well, what's going to happen then <clears throat> is that the interest rate that you're getting when you're laddering these is going to go down. But that is more okay because the real rate of return is still similar when you factor in that inflation is going to go away in that type of a scenario. Nonetheless, we're going to keep our eye on these, man. Even a two-year ladder, right? Rates are not going down for a couple of years, man. 5.5%, a two-year ladder. If you're talking about investment money, you know, you're pushing 5.15%. And that is as of this morning. Be interesting to see if that changes. What were we at last week? 5.11 and 5.12 potentially on that number. So we've seen the 10-year rise. The two-year, not so much. The two-year is locked in where it is right now. It is moving, okay? But I had to have that conversation because we're gonna keep our eye on that. And here's kind of the case of the two-year, right? Look at the two-year. The two-year is not even below where we were two weeks ago on Wednesday. Compare that to the 10-year, folks, okay? Two full points below where we're at. Now, that was the Fed day Wednesday. You could say that we're a point and a half below on the 10-year, but it is the longer part of this curve, not the two-year, okay? The Fed spoke. Everything calibrated. You got to move from 101.15 down to 101.07 on Fed Day, and that's where we've stayed on the two-year versus the 10-year and even the 30-year. Look at the trend in these longer-term yields and realize that the shift is not right now on a, a Fed over the next two years. The, the shift right now is a dramatic shift in the repricing of the longer-term part of the curve. Now, we jump around from there. That is part of the equation that uninverts the yield curve, okay? Because what do we have? We have a yield curve that is dramatically inverted to the tune of pulling up rates where they are on a duration basis. You get the two years sitting at 5.11. We were approaching 5.2. We were approaching 5.2 on the two year, okay? So we've had the two year pull back. Meanwhile, I get the 10 year right now. 4.72, we'll call it, okay? So your two years at 5.1, your 10 years at about 4.7, you got about 4 tenth percent, 4.1, excuse me, 0.41% is the inversion right now between the two year and the 10 year. Well, you might not get the two year going down anytime soon, but what could save all the recession indicators, okay, is you're gonna get a higher rate for longer. You're going to get a higher interest rate, uh, maybe a higher R star, that neutral rate the Fed is looking for. Stay tuned, folks. We got lots to talk about today. We're coming back with our man Kevin Hinks from the Schwab Network. We'll be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. 
Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything, from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at tfnn.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Welcome back, folks. We'll get markets in red territory. You get the S&P futures off by 29 points. We're trading at 42.95 right now. That's a decline of about two-thirds percent. We get the NASDAQ 100 reaching pre-market session lows almost right now. We're trading off eight-tenths percent off 125 points in the NASDAQ 100. To talk about some of the market action, let's jump over to our man Kevin Hinks. Every trading day, folks, 12 noon Eastern time, right here on Tiger TV, the Schwab Network with Fast Market. Your host, Kevin Hinks, Tom White, the team at the Schwab Network. Uh, great lineup of guests. They usually walk you through three hypothetical trade setups, folks. If you ever want to learn about options, okay, even if you don't trade options, I always say understanding them can help any trader. Check out the program Fast Market at 12 o'clock. Kevin Hanks, how about these yields, man? Good morning, Tommy O'Brien. Yeah, higher yields, higher dollar, both of them weighing on stocks, Tommy. And it looks like the start of October is very similar to what we saw in September. So at least the start of October, Tommy. So, yeah, choppy waters right now as we deal with not higher yields, Tommy. I would call them spiking yields. And the markets don't like spiking yields, Tommy. They make the market uncomfortable. Now, if they plateau out, if they calm down, the markets get less uncomfortable. But right now, we are in full uncomfortable mode, Tommy. That's a good way to put it, man. Full uncomfortable mode. Uh, I was talking about, I kicked off the program, Kevin, just taking a look at, you know, the two-year, which obviously moved on Fed decision about two weeks ago now. And then you have the 10-year and the 30-year. And we've really seen since two weeks ago, the longer duration yields, right, are the ones that are really moving the most right now, at least since we got that Fed move um, of a couple weeks ago. And that I was talking about potentially the yield inversion and how, you know, now you have longer term yields. They're rising a bit. You still have the two year well above where the 10 year is. But how do you look at that inversion right now, Kevin? It's 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 got a long way to go. But longer rates going up, that would be one thing that might save all these indicators saying, you know, the yield inversion. We've all been hearing it for so long. It's a recessionary indicator. What do you think about the inversion of the yield curve still and kind of some of that movement, especially on the 10 year and the 30 year? 
Yeah, the yield curve is steepening. It's not all the way there yet, but it is starting to steepen. And that's probably the function of the understanding that interest rates are going to stay higher for longer, right? Loretta Messer said it yesterday in some of her comments. She said her comment was, we are likely near or possibly the peak of the Fed funds tightening cycle. Now our task turns to ensuring that we keep monetary policy restrictive for long enough, Tommy. So higher for longer means now the back months or the, you know, the longer dated instruments are starting to move higher. So, yeah, that is steepening the yield curve. We'll see how, how it finally plays out. But, um, yeah, those higher yields, you know, they affect stocks. The higher dollar, the Bank of Japan move to go back in buying bonds starting tomorrow, that's, that's moving the dollar. Yields are higher. That works against stocks. You see stocks were, you know, yesterday's market, Tommy, was interesting. The Magnificent 7, or 6 of the 7, without Tesla, kept the market looking better than it actually was, in my opinion, because take those 6 or 7 stocks out, and the market was weak yesterday as well showing that again this morning tommy it was a great point i was looking at apple yesterday i just pulled it up at least apple and microsoft when you were having the conversation microsoft trades from about 316 to 322 yesterday man and apple shares right out of the gate jump from like 171 up to almost 174 yeah 174 at one point yesterday strong day from some of those big tech stocks with that in mind, man, October started yesterday, Kevin. Uh, we're coming into a new season, of course, but we got a little bit of a lull before we really kick things off on earnings. What are you guys talking about on Fast Market coming up on the Schwab Network at 12 today, man? We're going to look at Boeing. That stock is getting absolutely annihilated lately uh, on, on the downside here, getting severely oversold. Uh, like Foley was going to do a presentation on Spotify. And then we're going to look at Amazon in the final Ooh. segment. So three really big, high-profile names we're looking at today. Boeing, Spotify, Amazon. Amazon, man, quite a run from the first of the year. I got it up here on the Thinkorswim platform. $81.43, man, is the low there as we were right near the beginning of the year and quite a pullback, though, from that high above 145. Kevin, I appreciate the time as always. Can't wait to talk to you tomorrow. We'll see where yields drive some of this conversation, and we look forward to the show today talking about uh, some of those equities. I had Boeing up there, too, quite a pullback for Boeing. I think I saw one of the airlines inking a deal with Airbus potentially this morning over the weekend. Maybe I saw that. Uh, Kevin, I appreciate it, man. Have a great day. We'll be watching at 12 o'clock today, man. Have a great day, Tommy. Thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. Folks, check it out. Fast Market from the Schwab Network. Uh, aired every day, 12 till 1, right here, live on Tiger TV. Kevin Hinks, Tom White, they have an outstanding lineup of guests that they bring on. And the way they walk you through hypothetical trade setups, folks, for me, is the best way to learn. You're talking about three trades every hour that they're walking you through. They'll manage them the next day. You know, if it needs trade management, that's a lot of what you learn. And as I always say when I bring Kevin on, if you don't trade options, that I understand, but understanding how they trade, understanding how they're priced, understanding the implied volatility with them that is priced in, et cetera, it speaks a lot about what the market is pricing in for equities as well. So even if you're an equities trader, understanding how the option market is pricing things, that's something that will help you as an equities trader, even if you don't trade options. And yeah, uh, I'll have to find that news because I think I did see something. Um, and I'm just seeing Wells Fargo with some stuff in terms of the news, but I thought I saw something talking about a deal potentially with one of the big airlines getting some uh, getting some new Airbus planes. I said, uh, oh. all right, I'll have to fight through that at the break. But nonetheless, there's the chart of Boeing, man, pulling back from 240 to 187. And I mean, look at this thing longer term, right? Quite the spike up to 446. You got the 737 max pullback which was from 446 down to about 350. Then you got the COVID drop off that put it down to 100. Uh, since then, you're facing some resistance at the 240 to 250 area. That's where you pulled back from this year. You got up on the COVID highs to about 278, that high of 2021. Really interesting when you look back, right? How some of the market, it was a, it was an early spike for some equities. Boeing, I mean, we got the highs in the market at the end of 2021. By that point, Boeing had already pulled back from 280 to what, 200. I mean, another stock that made that peak early. Amazon actually uh, 
No, so not, not so much the case. I guess they got up to that high, though, in September of 2020 and went nowhere until the market fell apart towards the end of 2021. Uh, Disney was another one, right? Early, early accelerator and had already pulled back. Yeah, made it to 2000, uh, excuse me, 203 by March of 2021. By the time the market had peaked out, you're already back to 145. Just interesting. Uh, you learn from history, folks, in terms of the rollover was taking place in some of these equities. And the FANG stocks, remember, we're holding up so well. Kevin put it yesterday, holding up so well. Um, yeah, there was Apple's acceleration into the market highs. Not a coincidence, right, peaking out. But guess what? We got new highs from Apple. Pretty remarkable. Microsoft shares, Kevin mentioned it. Strong day yesterday from some of these FANG stocks. Not so much the case this morning. Microsoft charges higher to almost 322. 322.48 was the high. We finished the session at 321.80 yesterday. And uh, yeah, we're going to give up about two, three dollars right now for Microsoft shares, but quite the acceleration for them. And we got to keep our eye on yields in the dollar. A little bit of a give back in terms of the lows. We did have a 106 handle in that 10 year. And as Kevin said, said, it might be able to handle higher rates. But boy, can it handle a 10 year going from 117 to 107 over a period of five months? Because that is what is happening right now, man. Stay tuned, folks. We're coming back for the open. Don't go away. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30 plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. For free, each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV.
Welcome back, folks. We have the market open, and S&Ps catch a little bit of a lift coming into that opening bell. We're still down by about 20 points, or just about half a percent in the S&P. NASDAQ 100 off six-tenths percent. All the markets catch a little bit of a lift in the last few minutes coming into the opening bell. Dow off 110, the Russell off by seven, and uh, it was United, the airline. United closing in is the headline here, but I think, um, yeah, as soon as today. A321, Airbus, narrow-body jets. United closes in on an order for them. As soon as Tuesday today, yeah, a purchase by United would add to the 120 A321 in the U.S. airline. The U.S. airline already has on backlog. So they have 120 already. The airlines pay about $60 million each, and they got 120 on backlog. Uh, they've been loading up on the largest Airbus narrow, Airbus narrow body as the airline retires, the Boeing 757. They've ordered some of the rival 737 MAX model as well. And they've been one of the largest post-pandemic aircraft buyers and said plans to add about 700 narrow and wide body planes over the next decade. 700 planes over 10 years, right? Hiring more than 10,000 pilots. I mean, 10 years, I know 10 years is a long time, but 10 years ain't that long a time, man, to add 700 planes on one airline. You jump over United shares, down a bit, down about 6 tenths percent right now with the market in negative territory for United. Okay, let's talk a little bit of markets. Pulling over one of the articles I was reading this morning. This one from Bloomberg, Treasury sell-off fuels speculation that bond vigilantes are back. You better believe it, man. This bond market is volatile. And, and ripe for even more accelerations, potentially. Now, this story out last night, and just some of the statistics in here, I mean, pretty remarkable when you look at this chart, right? Yields, we all know they were low, pandemic lows, right? 2020, Fed cuts everything, rates go to basically zero, they're sitting, 10-year treasuries yield, yield at half a percent. My brain always goes to, somehow, when I see charts like this, and this is where banks decided to put all of their money when there was an influx of deposits on a long duration. How does that happen, right? And then look what happened. Yeah, of course it did. Who was locking in 0% interest rate right there, man? The risk was not worth the reward. That's something you always want to keep in mind, folks, okay? Cash can get destroyed, but is the risk worth the reward? I mean, everything in life has a risk-reward ratio, not to get philosophical, but it really does. And many times, that is the calculation that drives many people in terms of what they decide to do with their action, risk versus reward. Zero percent interest rates, man, putting your money there at a long duration. And then, you know, as we all know, and then everyone's surprised somehow when they go BK. But check out the acceleration, right? This is the 10-year. I said, we're at 4.7, even from where we were a couple of years ago, right? This, this recent run starting since May, where we've just really spiked from a 10-year approaching 3.5 to 4.5%, well above anywhere we've been in the last 16 years or so is the number. Now, what this talks about, though, is the ma manufacturing PMI. To give this some context here, okay? They're talking about it's been excessive given recent economic data, okay? And that it's decoupling from manufacturing data. That is the purchasing manufacturing index in red and you see the decouple in terms of it rising as we got a rise and then quite the pullback in manufacturing which has not correlated to a pullback in yields okay one other chart that i thought was cool that i thought you gold bugs may appreciate the 10-year treasury yield diverges from copper gold ratio okay now this is ed is it ed yardini I believe it is right yeah, economist Ed Yardini, and he's been a bear, okay, so take it for what it's worth. But he's talking about a decoupling here that is signaling, okay, most of the bond indicators that worked in the past haven't been working. We suspect the Fed officials may soon be alarmed by the unyielding climb in yields. If they aren't already, they should be. The bond yield was highly correlated with the ratio of the prices of copper to gold from 2005 to 2019. They've diverged significantly since then, and you check out the acceleration There is a correlation, highly correlated, that's, that's a little bit debatable, but yes, but you see the decoupling that has taken place, man, okay? You have the copper-gold ratio sitting at just above one, 
Meanwhile, you've got yields pushing 5%. The last time yields were pushing 5% in 2006 and 2007, you really got an acceleration there. Not the case right now. What that means exactly, I'm not sure. He's pointing to a decoupling in yields, though, okay? And that I would keep my eye on. Because even if these charts don't illustrate that that's what's coming, folks, there is still dramatic risk. Everybody's talking about supply. And I can't help but talk about yields endlessly on the program because it's, it's a vicious cycle, okay? When you think about the fact that, number one, I've talked about that things look rosy on this chart because it goes back to 2003. You put the 30-year back here. And you go back to 2003 and you see anywhere before this chart, that's the 30 year. Yeah, anywhere before that point in the chart, that's actually the high point on the chart that you were at. You actually got much lower when yields were much higher, okay? And these were not the crazy 80 time, 80s times, folks. I was in high school during 97. You were the 30 year trading at 89, it's at 111. So there is room for things to change in terms of the yields. And then you go to the debt. Of course, that becomes political. I'm glad the country didn't shut down, okay? You gotta pay your bills. We gotta figure out how to pay the bills and we pair the debt in terms of just not paying our bills is probably not the solution. I understand everybody uh, uses any type of leverage they can during a negotiation. It's tough when going over the cliff. Um, hurts real people in terms of those paychecks. Stop, I mean, servicemen and women stop getting paychecks during that. You're gonna have potentially payouts for retirees, all these, all these 10-year yields we're talking about, those could be impacted, right? But all that aside, politics aside, the debt we have is a large number. If interest rates go up, that debt becomes more expensive to service, thereby requiring you to issue more debt to service the debt you have, right? It's a very difficult prospect right now. And when you think about, okay, the risk I mean, folks, we, what did we just get, a six to seven week stopgap measure to keep the government open? And you're telling me right now that you'd trust the government for 30 years with your money? And meanwhile, you're getting barely over what you get for a five year? The risk associated on the longer term duration government bonds with what's going on is very difficult to assess as somebody that is just looking at the risk reward of receiving your money back on a timely basis, okay? I don't imagine things are gonna fall apart in the next year or two, but over the course of 10 to 20 to 30 years, I hope we're still paying our bills, but if I was viewing this as a business transaction where the other counterparty was just a business entity, and I saw the inner workings of that business entity barely keeping their operations open, barely basically giving themselves the ability to issue more debt to pay the bills they've already incurred. And I considered lending that business money. I would have a severe risk on a longer term basis, understanding why I never saw the potential for an impasse that somehow stopped payments to a certain degree. With that in mind, right, yields may be persisting because you're gonna have a supply problem, man. Okay, and until we get that under control, I think rates on a longer term basis have to go higher and we're seeing that happen. Stay tuned folks, Markets in Red, we'll be right back. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the Opening Call newsletter at TFNN.com. The Opening Call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. 
Direction Leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tigers Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablet as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFN. .com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks. We get the S&Ps right now off by about 20 points. You get the NASDAQ 100 off by 80, the Dow off by 95. And uh, talking a little bit of Fed, talking a little bit of interest rates right now. You have the Atlanta Fed, excuse me. Yes. Uh, Raphael Bostic. Yes, Atlanta Fed chief. Just want to make sure for some reason question myself. Uh, so he's out here this morning making a lot of sense, I think. I'm not in a hurry to raise, but I'm not in a hurry to reduce either. The Fed should hold interest rates at elevated levels for a long time, quote unquote, to bring inflation back down to its 2% tar target. He called that 2% non-negotiable. Can't wait to see if they actually try and tweak that going forward. Times change, though, as we know, folks. So I want us to hold. I think that's appropriate thing to do for a long time. That's what they're saying now. It doesn't have to be the case. He does not vote on the rate decisions this year, okay? But this is the message getting pushed out there, and I think it's probably going to be the way that plays out, at least for the November meeting. They're at almost 5.5%. Where the economy is growing right now is not 5.5%. So it's a probably a restrictive, everything's probably in this, right? Because I don't know where exactly the economy is growing right now on October 3rd. So everything is kind of a personal take, opinion, guess, best guess scenario with the information available. But they're at almost five and a half percent. The economy's probably inflation is probably not five and a half percent right now. The economy's probably not growing at five and a half percent. That means it's a restrictive rate policy. As the rates go down, right? I, excuse me. As inflation wanes, as growth recedes a bit from the growth that drove generational inflation, that five and a half percent actually becomes more restrictive the closer the Fed gets to their 2% goal. So that's even more worrisome if you're still hiking at a time when you have inflation coming down. Let's just say you think inflation is at about 4% right now. Let's say you, all right, let's do 4.5, okay? Let's say people out there think inflation is at about 4.5%. Now, on a core basis, it's probably a little bit lower than that right now, which is what the Fed is looking at. So let's say core inflation is at about 4%, okay? just using simple numbers. The Fed is at about 5.5%, okay? It's a percentage and a half above the growth rate in the economy, if that was the R star, which doesn't quite correlate, right? Inflation does not equal R star, but R star is kind of the natural growth rate of the economy, that if the Fed matches the R star, that that is 
bliss, that's euphoria, right? The cost of capital is just equivalent to the growth rate, therefore not allowing it to overheat or overcool, okay? But they're all theoretical numbers. Nobody actually knows where that number is today, which is important. They're just trying to peg that number. But let's say our star's at 4%, the Fed's at 5.5%, right? Well, let's say they bring inflation down a bit. Now you have core inflation at 3.5%. Fed's still at 5.5%. It's even more restrictive now because the growth of the economy is only 3.5%, and they're still at 55 Then you get it down to 3%, right? Well, geez, now it's really restrictive because the economy was growing at 4%, and the Fed was charging 5.5% for capital. But now it's only growing at 3%, and they're still charging 5.5% for capital. It's a bigger restrictive gap that it has on the economy. You get down to 25 you get the point, right? So what happens? As they get closer to 2%, that rate that they are at, even if they just stay there, is akin to putting more pressure actually on the economy. That could be an argument for eventually some cuts. You start getting down to those numbers because if they leave it at five and a half for too long, what's gonna happen? It's gonna become too restrictive because we get closer to 2% and you still got the Fed pushing five and a half percent, that could tighten the economy to a degree that could cause a recession. We get to see it all play out. But I thought that was an interesting take when you walk through the scenario of how that plays out. And yes, so keeping things higher for longer, as long as the trend keeps going that way, or even if it just stays, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, folks, even if it just stays where it is right now, as in if inflation is staying at 4% and we're making marginal gains to 3.8, to 3.75, to 3.6, every little marginal gain you get actually means that staying where you are for the Fed has more impact, it is a more restrictive policy than it was prior because as you inch towards 2%, remaining at the current rate that they're at, the Fed, at 55 almost, puts more pressure on the economy. So keep that one in mind too as they start having those conversations about potential cuts because at some point, a 5.5% Fed policy rate on a growth rate of like 4%, you could probably make the case that if the Fed's brought the growth rate down from four to three, well, maybe they could ease up a little bit on their 5.5% because you don't need to be at 5.5% anymore because now you got the inflation rate down from four to three. So even a number at five or 4.5 would still have an impact. It's kind of just a thought process, but that is going to be something we deal with if the Fed starts making progress. The flip side of that is, if it starts going up again, that is the scenario that they probably will consider hiking again. I think if we stay where we're at right now, they're just going to give it a long time. Because in theory, they are at a restrictive policy rate, man. And yes, it's going to take some time, but they'd rather do that than really start messing with, what, 10% mortgage rates, a 7% 10-year yield, stuff like that. Whew. That would really put some strain on the economic engine of capital and how it flows through the economy. Okay, what else do we got in here? Uh, yeah, let's talk about that. Jamie, Dor Jamie Diamond, he's talking about that the children are going to live to 100 and not have cancer because of technology. Very reasonable with the way biotech is progressing right now. And I like this one even better. They'll probably be working three and a half days a week. Why not three, Jamie? Why not three? No, I kid. Um, interesting nonetheless. Where does this fall? Because I have a kid who's two years. You saw him on the program yesterday. Uh, and I, I, I mentioned this in some of those talks the auto workers are having, right? Five day work week, two days of rest. Be able to question the norm, man, okay? Um, there's no reason why with the level of wealth and technology that our country has in particular and many countries out there in the first world that the five two business model could not be achievable in another fashion, especially with where technology is today and the, able to, the ability to work remotely. So, you know, they're talking about the auto workers potentially working four days. Well, you can make a very reasonable case outside of the personal bias that we all have because we've grown up in an economy where people are expected to work Monday through Friday and you're on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, can make a very reasonable case that working four days a week and only resting three days a week uh, it's still a lot of work for a lot of people, and I guarantee that the country could figure it out because guess what? Everybody said you couldn't work from home and figure it out, and we figured it out in like two weeks when we needed to, right? So just be able to be open to change 
and be aware of your personal biases. For certain companies, it's not gonna happen, okay? For certain positions, you still gotta work six days a week. But as time progresses and technology increases and AI helps things in terms of productivity, right? Very possible to achieve those types of um, productive gains with technology that might allow you not to have to work five and, and then rest two. All right, folks, stay tuned. We got one more segment, S&Ps right now, negative by 12 points. Markets catch a little bit on the open. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African RAND, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. We have yields. Uh, yeah, pulling back a bit from where we were. Let's check out in terms of where we are on that yield curve. But you talk about a pop right now. You have the 10-year trading at 106.29. We've driven all the way up to 107.10. You're talking about a 10-year yield just under 4.7% right now. We were at about 4.73, I think, 4.74, almost 4 and 3 quarters percent on the 10-year yield. We almost hit this morning. We're right at about 4.7% right now. And markets uh, easing a bit, as we've seen that with the S&Ps, had a 4,200 handle to kick off the program. We're trading right now at 43.15. And folks, if you didn't get a chance to check it out yesterday, a new program started yesterday on TFNN, our man Peter Bruno, the Wall Street Money Hour. So that is live from 2 till 3 p.m. Eastern time. That's Monday through Friday, every market day. 
Uh, he'll be in the slot right before my dad, coming up at 3 o'clock. So check out Peter's outstanding program yesterday. I know he's excited, man, to be um, doing the program out there every day. He's going to have the Wall Street Money Letter that's going to be up there on the website as well shortly. Uh, but check out the program, 2 to 3 p.m. Yes uh, yesterday it began, but that's every market day today. Wall Street Money Hour with Peter Bruno. So check that out at 2 o'clock today if you haven't yet, folks. And this market... You talk about relentless, right? We just got back 20 points in the S&P. We jump over to the VIX this morning, backing off a bit, but still relatively high. You're pushing an 18.15 VIX right now. And as we finish it up, we got about 30 seconds here. Article from the journal I found interesting this morning. This one out at eight in the morning. Wall Street thinks America's homes are overvalued. Okay. And <clears throat> this talks about, of course, as prices paid for the average single family property hit record highs, you have big investors potentially taking a pass. How about single family homes? Okay, property values back above where we were at a year ago. Remember that? We just got prints for, I think it was June or July, talking about we were actually above. Multifamily, not quite the case, man, for big investors. How about this chart here? The portion of US home purchases made by landlords with 1,000 plus houses. Look at the fall off. As you got big time investors pulling back, Yields playing a part of that for sure, okay? Yields playing a part of that for sure. Uh, and that's not even talking about corporate, man. Watch out for corporate as the world has changed. And uh, yeah, commercial real estate changed as well. Thanks so much, folks. Stay tuned. We got Basil coming up next. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.